Hi, welcome back to the workshop and a brand new video series. And in this series, we are talking to you all about digital sound. That's right, we talked a lot about sound in mm. Hornby Magazine. We've done lots of sound demonstrations, but what we want to do is bring you a video series that goes a little bit more in depth than that, and actually explains how it all works. Mm. Well, listen, Mike, when people talk about DCC and DCC sound, some people, of course, understand the basics. Other people go, well, I don't know the first thing about it. So, so first and foremost, what is DCC and how does sound fit into the system? Right, so DCC is the Digital Command Control Protocol, which is how we can drive trains with the digital system. So what that means in layman's terms is if you had an old analog controller, which is a 12 volt controller, when mm. you turn the power up on your controller, whatever's on the track will move at that voltage that's applied to the track. With a DCC system, there's a constant voltage to the track, which means that instead of driving the train direct, if you like, actually it's sending signals through the controller into a chip inside the train which tells it to move, turn lights on and off, and then it can actually operate sound functions as well, and mm. many more features as well. So DCC really did do away with having to have isolated sections in your track, didn't it? Yeah, that's right. So you no longer need to have an isolated section to park a loco up. You just park it up and select a different loco address, and off you go and drive another train. But already in this first couple of minutes, we've already talked about a whole load of terminology, which if you're new to digital sound, is going to mean absolutely nothing, nothing to you. To you. The, the, the address is where you live, and um, <laughs> a section is somewhere where you go, right? Is yeah, and a chip is something that you eat. Yes. So yes, that's right. We, we need to go back and sort some of these things yeah, out. Which so is the we'll, whole point of this series. Exactly, because I mean, in all honesty here, um, I understand the basics of DCC. I understand, obviously, that you can put in a number onto your control to have a, a locomotive move independently. I understand the sound functions, but as far as installation goes, I'm a complete novice, whereas Mike has done so many sound installations, chip installations, he knows DCC almost backwards. So this will be a beginner's guide for me, just as much as it will be for you. So let's start off with this. What is a DCC chip or a decoder? All right, so the, the chip or decoder is it's basically like a little mini computer, if you like. And what it is, we, we plug that into the locomotive, and then that takes the signals from the handset to interpret them into movement, sound, lighting. And it can send instructions out within the locomotive itself to actually make it do those things. Mm. This will be obviously somewhat of a silly question, but what's a handset and, and how does that relate to the chip? Uh, so the handset is exactly what we use to drive the, the locomotives. It connects into a, another word for you now, a base station, which is where the power comes in and is then fed back into the layout. Uh, it's a bit like your old transformer, if you like, if you had an old model railway. Uh, and that handset is the thing that sends the communication to the locomotive. So you can use a number of buttons on there. So you've got numbered buttons, which give instructions to, for example, number one might turn on the sound, mm -hmm. uh, but you can also use that number one when you're changing over which loco you're driving using its address. So the addressing thing, we probably need to address the addressing fairly soon. We will, I was, I was going to say that. So, so every single decoder or chip comes default as number three. The program, if you type in three or triple uh, O three onto your handset, that will be the default of every single decoder out there. But if you've got, for example, a black 545110, I mean, you can't have five numbers in a, in a chip, but you can have 4510, for example, or 5110. But how do people change that default number three to the locomotive that they want to assign it to? Right, so all of the handsets and base stations come with the capability to program a decoder. Uh, you need a programming track. You can program on the main as well, but it's not always the best plan. Uh, so having a programming track means you've got independent control of that loco to update its details of its decoder. So you can do a lot mm. more than change the address, but we'll come to that later. So, so a programming track. Now, what can that be? As you said, the main is obviously your main lamp, but a programming track, can that be literally just a piece of flexi track, or is it something separate altogether? It can literally just be a spare section of flexible track, which has got a pair of wires which go to the programming track outlet on the back of the DCC base station. It sounds complicated, doesn't it? It does, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's yeah. labelled. I think that's the beauty of a lot of these things. Is it, the terminology can sometimes sound a little bit daunting, but everything's labelled. Mm. Yes, if, if I held up the back of our Prodigy um, base station now, you'd see on the back of it, it says main track, programming track. So you, you, the instructions are always there wherever you're going. Okay. Uh, and we'll show you a little bit more of that later in the series. As well. Absolutely. Okay, so you've got your, your DCC base station which with your handset, which you then enter in the locomotive number, which then sends a digital signal to the chip in the locomotive, which then powers it. So how does sound, or when did sound, come into DCC? Because from my knowledge, DCC didn't start with sound, did it? Um, no, but it wasn't long after, set, well, after DCC was introduced that actually sound came along as well. Uh, so there have been sound chips around for uh, model railway locomotives since, since the, the late 2000s. Uh, particularly in the UK market, they're a bit earlier into the main European market. 
Um, we started out really having one brand, which is really known in the UK for sound at that point, which is ESU. Mm -hmm. uh, they did the lock sound decoders. The first chips we had here in the UK were lock sound 3.5s. Um, so it shows there have been a few versions before that. Now we've since been through the lock sound 4 and now the lock sound 5 is the very latest generation for lock sound from ESU. Uh, but there's also lots of other brands to choose from as well now mm. for sound. So another really strong brand in sound is Zimo. Uh, they produce a really broad range of really quality decoders. Uh, there's also uh, Dolan House, which is supplied in the UK by Locomand Sounds. And there's also um, things like for example, the Soundtracks. Soundtracks does a multi-sound sound decoder. So you can buy one sound chip from them and it'll have half a dozen steam locomotives or half a dozen diesel locomotives on it. And you can select different uh, options on that to actually drive different locomotive sounds through your loco. And then there's also the most recent thing we've seen is the Hornby Triple X sound system, which is a Bluetooth control system. Mm -hmm. uh, it still uses DCC protocols, but it communicates direct to the loco over Bluetooth through their app, or you can drive them through a conventional DCC handset as well. And this actually brings me to a, another really important question. There may be some people out there thinking to themselves, well, I've got a Digitrack system, or I've got a Gauge Master system, or I've got a system that not many other people have got. Maybe some people are thinking, can I use this system for these different decoders and, and different systems? Yeah, so the, the beauty of DCC is it has protocols and um, compliance with it as well. Um, complicated words, but what that means is that everything works with everything and it's designed to a set framework to be able to do the same with any controller. So if you've got Digitrax, NCE, Gauge Master, um, Hornby, uh, Backman, all those use the same functionality to actually control anyone else's decoders. So a Gauge Master system can control a uh, Lock Sound, a Zimo, a Dolan Haas, a Hornby, um, a DCC concepts. Anyone's decoders can be controlled by anyone's base station. Now, before, when you talked about the Hornby Triplex sound system, you mentioned Bluetooth. Now, that is not your, your typical but um, handset, is it? That's where you can control it from your phone or your tablet. Yeah, that's right. So that's a very new system. So Hornby introduced this in 2023. Uh, so the, the concept of it is that you've got, um, everyone's got a smartphone these days. Say so everyone, that's probably a bit of a rude statement in a way, but a lot of people have a smartphone or might have a tablet, so like a, an iPad or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and this new system from Hornby allows you to use that modern technology to drive your trains with a Bluetooth signal. So you still need the same power to your track to actually provide the electricity for them to actually move and create all the functionality. But whereas conventional DCC sends all those signals it needs to instruct the loco to make a certain sound, turn the lights on, move, whatever it may be, but that's all sent through the track. The Bluetooth system sends it through Bluetooth. So there's no interruptions of, of power issues for mm -hmm. the Bluetooth signals. Uh, and it's just, it's another way of being able to control your train. So I think probably one of the best things about TXS is it also means that you can upload your own sound profiles through the app uh, onto your decoders. So for example, if you bought a, a Class 60, for example, and you've got a sound chip with a Class 60 sound profile in it, and then six months later you decide that actually, I want to take that decoder out of that and use it for my Class 37. Mm -hmm. You can then change the sound profile over to be a Class 37 in it. And if then six months after that, you decide it wanted to be a 9F, then you can change it to be a 9F sound profile. Uh, it's a really clever system to be able to actually be able to be so intuitive for the customer to upload their own sound profiles and change the code around for what they want to do. So Hornby Triplex is basically sort of the, the introduction to sound as such. You can really sort of get familiar with what it can do, the functionality, and kind of troubleshoot a few things at the same time. Yeah, that's right. It's a good place to learn. It's a lot cheaper than some of the higher end brands. So it's about, about £65 for a decoder from the Hornby Triplex range. We've got mm -hmm. a collection of those in stock at the Key Model World shop as well. Um, Whereas with a higher end decoder like ones from Zimmer or ESU, you're looking at more like £120 plus for a decoder, uh, for a sound decoder that is. Mm -hmm. um, and it, the, the, the triple X sound ones, okay, their functionality isn't as broad as the ESU ones or the Zimmer ones, but it, it's got plenty for most people, certainly when you're starting out with sound. Okay, it's, there's 28 sound functions, you've got uh, playable brake sounds, you've got playable horn sounds. Mm. One of the things I really like about them is they've got um, three different horn sounds on each horn. So oh. for example, if you press function two for the horn, once you'll get horn sound one, press it again, you'll get a different horn sound, press it again, you get a different horn sound. Um, it's also got a really clever feature called auto function, which when you press function 28 and set that onto the TXS chips, it will actually play automatic sounds as it's running around. So then you don't have to go back and press the horn sounds or the brake squeal sounds or the guard's whistle sounds, where it may be. Oh. It plays those things automatically. So. And that's, that's unique to TXS, is it? Yes. Interesting. Now, you mentioned before about sound profiles. Now, there could be th people out there thinking, well, Mike, I've got a bullied light Pacific, or I've got a Class 66, or I've got an HST. 
where do I find sound profiles and do sound profiles exist for what I've actually got? Like, so, how many yeah. profiles are out there? So, sound profiles are out there for pretty much everything you could imagine for a model railway locomotive. So, whether you're looking for a diesel sound or a steam sound, there's something out there for you. So, th there's a lot of sound suppliers out there producing bespoke digital sound for model railway locomotives. One of the big names in there is, is DC Kits with their Lego Ram Defo collection. Uh, that's mainly focused on the diesel. Uh, era models, mm -hmm. uh, but very well sort of low code sounds with ESU decoders. Um, DC Kits also supplies supplies wheel tapper sounds as well, which is mainly steam period sound locomotives. Then you've got Digitrains, which produces sound files for Zimo uh, decoders for both steam and diesel locomotives. Uh, you've got Coastal DCC doing sounds across a different range of locos. You've got uh, YouTube, he does a huge collection of sound profiles as well. Um, there's a whole list of different people doing sound. And of course, DCC sound isn't just limited to locomotives either. I mean, I've seen, for example, you can get a decoder with a, a sound file for a signal box. Yes, you can, yes. You can, you can get ancillary functions for signal boxes. Actually, I've got one which used to be actually still on top of there, even though we just started rebuilding that, but it's still inside the signal box. Um, also, Hornby did a, a TTS vent van, their previous generation of sound decoder called Twin Track Sound. And they did a vent van which had a uh, option to have different sound play for it for different um, sound backgrounds like country sounds, town sounds, those sorts of things. So you got a bit of ambient sound going off with the railway as well. Uh, but then there's also things like, for example, um, Mega Man Biffo. He does sound files for things like driving van trailers. And you think, well, why would I need a sound profile for a driving van trailer? Remember, if you've mm -hmm. got, like, for example, a Class 91 with a Mark IV rake and a DVT, if you're going DVT first, all of a sudden your DVT needs to make horn sounds because Correct. it's now leading the train. It also comes to things like carriage, wine, bogey noise, all those kind of things. You get that extra level of functionality from things. So sound really has brought in that sort of 4D experience to model railways, hasn't it? I remember oh, yeah. when we, uh, we, we captured that layout, Allaby, that wonderful O-gauge layout, which we had at Getz a few years ago, and it's just recently been in our magazine. They even spoke about that, you know, it brings it to life. You've got models over there with such heft and mass, but the sound gives you that, that extra bit of realism, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, that, again, the further we've gone with digital sound in, in the model railway market, the more immersive it's become as well. You know, you, you really feel like you're in control of the locomotive now. I mean, the sound mm -hmm. functionality that's in the, the latest high-end models, it's, it's just amazing. You know, manual throttle notching, where you can actually control what the engine sounds are doing to make it replicate whether it's working with a heavy train, light engine mode, all those kind of things. And actually the quality of the audio as well is incredible. You know, these mm -hmm. things really do replicate exactly what the real locomotive sounds. It's not just a generic, here's a train sound. It's like if you buy a Class 37, it sounds like a Class 37. You know, if you buy an INF, it sounds like an INF. Um, they are proper sounds that are built into these decoders and mm. recorded to a really high standard. I'm sure that you're out there thinking right now, this is a lot of information to, to digest and understand. And don't get me wrong, I agree with you. I'm, I'm right there with you. But it all isn't too complicated. I mean, this is of course an introduction to DCC sound, isn't it? And so right. on the layout over here, we've actually got several different examples from different manufacturers. We've got steam, we've got diesel most of which come factory fitted with sound, don't they? Yeah, that's right. It's just a small selection of different manufacturers' products. We've got Backman Acura Scale, Hornby, and Cab Alex Models products on here today. So when it comes, let's, let's look at steam first. When it comes to the steam locomotives, whereabouts do they actually fit things like the decoder, the speaker, and so forth? Because let's face it, if you've got a, a, a Hornby model that's tender drive, for example, and you want to put something in there where well, you haven't got lots of room in the tender, but you've got lots of room in the boiler, but if these come fitted, where, is the, where does it all belong? Right, so it, it depends on the period of the model and how it's set up. So in, in the early days of steam locomotives, in terms of sound and DCC, everything was kept in the boiler. Whereas the more we moved into the sound side of things, the more decoder sockets got moved into the tender because there was more space for a speaker and for the decoders to sit in there as well. Mm -hmm. So for example, on the layout today, the, uh, the, 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 the Patriot here, all the decoder and speaker for that is all in the tender for that. Uh, whereas the, um, the A1 that's here, the Speaker's in the tender, but the decoder is in the locomotive. So it depends on the loco and what period it's from. Similarly with the turbo motive, actually, Hornby again has changed how it's doing things there because it's now got the working lights on it as well. They moved all the decoder and speaker space into the boiler instead uh, to keep everything together so you can have so many wires going back and forth between the locomotive and tender. But mm -hmm. there is still space for a second speaker if you want to be clever with a turbo motive as well. So again, just because the model comes saying that I need a speaker and a tender and a decoder and a boiler doesn't mean that's how, how you have to do it. And the number of installations I've done, which are a bit more complex than this particular introduction we're doing here, I've basically started again, mm -hmm. taking all the wiring out, taking all the socket out and wire my own decoder in my own way to make sure I can get the maximum size of the speaker and maximum performance out of the model as well. Right. So how easy is it to actually take apart the tender and, you know, 
either fit in a chip or refit or get into the sound system? Yeah, so for a, for a straightforward installation, following the spaces that are provided by a manufacturer, it is quite simple. So you can use a couple of screws, take the tender body off, and it's quite easy with a tender space because then you're not having to handle the whole locomotive either. Mm -hmm. um, you then pop the tender body off, you usually have a space in the bottom for where the, the speaker sits, and there's a space for the decoder to sit on top of that, so everything's nice and neat. Um, where it gets complicated is where you get into my mindset and going, well, it's nice that it fits a 28mm round speaker, but could I put something better in there? And that's where you then start taking things out and putting things in and making things different. But that's, that's another story. Like I said, he knows DCC <laughs> backwards rather than people like you and me. So, so bring this down to the introduction yeah, exactly. level. So the, the, the nice thing though is now that actually the way that model manufacturing has moved on is actually more and more the sound fitted version from the factory is becoming a much more attractive thing as well. Mm. The first factory sound models weren't as good as what we've got now by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. You know, yes, they made nice sounds and they sounded like locos, but sometimes the problem with driving characters Characteristics. Like one of the things I had where I'd want a diesel to, I'd slow a diesel locomotive down, but the sound kept running at full thrash. It's like, well, why isn't it matching what's happening? Mm. But all those things have disappeared now. All those things now are tempered to work together. So modern models, if you really want the best in the sound, are the simplest and best way to get into it. And that's one of the things we really want to talk about today with this, what we've got here today, yeah. is actually all these locos are here right now are all factory sound fitted locos. All that are ever so slightly different ways and with little subtle nuances between each one of them, um, but all doing the same basic thing of offering top quality sound in the model from the factory, so you haven't got to do any modifications to your loco at all. Yes. Well, we've spoken about the steam locomotives. We can briefly talk about the diesels. So if in a steam locomotive you've got the chip and the speaker and the tender, in the diesels, where are they typically housed? Actually, they're normally on top of the chassis. But again, things are starting to move on, things are starting to change. So the class 47 that's here from Backman, that's quite an interesting one, because that's the latest generation from Backman. Mm -hmm. um, the Dakota socket and the main speaker are on top of the main PCB, but it's also got a second speaker in this as well. So now we're to a place where actually we're getting multiple speakers fitted to models to provide a better tonal range as well. So it means that then you're not just getting a thin speaker with just high-end frequency, you get more of the bass sound as well. Mm. You know, you imagine standing next to one of these, you, know, you get that bass thump from the engine. If that's not replicated in your model, well, you're missing something, aren't you? Yeah. So, but that's now being incorporated. You know, speaker technology is moving on all the time as well. Um, so all that's inside. Now, the interesting thing with the Batman 47 is you have to take the whole body off that if you want to get access to the decoder socket. But what starts to happen with some more recent models, particularly from Cavalex models and Curascale, is they're creating removable roof hatches. So you can mm. pop a little roof hatch off, gives you direct access to the decoder, makes it really simple to change out, a speaker, uh, change out a speaker or to change out from being DCC ready to DCC sound fitted as well. Um, and that's a bit of a game changer, I think, in terms of making digital sound accessible for people. Do you think it gives a lot more modelers a lot more confidence in able to get to the chip, get to the speaker without accidentally making a mistake? Uh, yeah, definitely. But there's also now, I think there's, there's much more desire to want sound. And actually what we tend to see now is actually the sound fitted versions of models tend to be much more appealing for people to buy anyway, straight mm. from the box. Now, like I said, sound's moved on so much from in terms of a factory fitted sound loco, where 10, 15 years ago, a factory sound fitted loco was a, well, it might be okay. Whereas now a factory fitted sound loco, is, that will be okay. You know, you've got the conference of knowing it's going to do what you want it to do. It's going to sound what you want it to sound like. And everyone's working really hard to keep moving the sound forward and make it more intuitive, more exciting, more interesting for people. I mean, for example, the new Backman Class 31s have just been announced. Mm. Their sound fit and deluxe version now comes with a digital operated automatic coupling. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and the sound file that goes along yes. with it. Yeah, and the sound file that matches the coupling sound as well. Exactly. So it actually, there's a guy who says, squeeze up, and the loco squeezes up, and then detaches the coupling and moves away. It's amazing. It's, it's very impressive. Yeah. Very impressive. Squeeze up. Squeeze up. Yeah, but that's, that's kind of, I suppose, is the reason I mentioned that is that's just how far sound is going. You know, and that's not the end of it. We know sound's going to go further. Mm. There'll be more capabilities of what these things can do in the future as well. Now, DCC and sound is a bit more pricey than just your typical non-DC system. So what is the difference between sound files? Because obviously some of it is a little bit more rudimentary and others is, is far more advanced. What is sort of the price range that we're looking at difference-wise? There's different capabilities to the decoder. What I'm tending to find now is with, with the factory sound, whether it's a Hornby TXS or um, ESU or Zimmo, is the quality of sound is very good. 
Now, there's more quality from the 16-bit quality you get from the ESU or Zimmer decoders than you get from the TXS ones, mm. but they're still very good value. So the TXS product decoders are priced around £65 a piece, um, but if you're looking around £120 plus for a fully high-end Zimmo or um, ESU decoder, um, they're much more capable in terms of sound performance, got a lot more channels as well. So one of the really big differences with a TXS decoder, for example, you can only have three sounds playing at once, so mm -hmm. main engine sounds plus two ancillary sounds. Whereas with a ESU and a Zimmo chip, you can have multiple sounds layered over the top of each other. So you can have um, the main ring sound, you can have um, horn sounds, you can have flange squeal, you can have brake sounds. All these things can be layered on top of each other. So you get much more depth of, of, of sound performance. Um, so that, that's where the real difference comes from. Mm. It's like slightly difference between a, a, a basic um, little speaker in the corner from the hi-fi and having a full PA system. Yeah. Well, look, Mike, I think we've probably spoken enough and filled everyone's heads with a, a lot of information. How about we actually get onto the layout and have some of these locomotives operating and give them a practical demonstration of what we've just been discussing? Yeah, that'd be great. I like playing trains anyway, so you know, I'm in. Who doesn't love playing trains? Absolutely. Steam locomotives in the 1960s were seldom cleaned and taken care of. Even the youngest classes, the Mighty 9Fs, looked like they were in a rundown state of operation. In part two of our series, Mike Wilde demonstrates how to weather two of these majestic locomotives in the form of a standard 9F with a light weathered finish and a crusty boilered 9F with a heavy weathered finish, using off-the-shelf items such as powders, paints and washes and an airbrush kit such as that available in the Key Model World shop. Join us in part two of 1960s Style Weathering, available to watch free and exclusively on keymodelworld.com. Okay, so we've got our uh, first loco on the layout now, which is uh, an Acura Scale Class 37, 6703. So the first thing I'm going to do is use my handset to select that loco address. I've already pre-programmed it to be 6703 as its address. So on this Gage Master Prodigy, I just press the loco button and type in 6703 and then press enter. And now it's ready for me to drive. So the first thing I'm going to do is turn the main running sounds on with function one. And then I'm going to press function zero to actually turn the lights on, on at each end of the loco as well. So the lights are very subtle on a, a BR era loco like this. Uh, but it's also got advanced functions with the lighting on this as well. So I can use function 19 by typing in shift and 19 on this, which then turns on the cab control desk lights as well. Right, so we're now ready to move away from the yard to go and take our 37 out to a train. So we're going to have a little short blast on a horn using function 13. So press in shift and 13. So I'm going to move the throttle to speed step one to move it away from the siding. And as I do that, it'll make a brake release sound automatically and the local will start to move away. With a small throttle increase, it'll keep the engine revs quite low. Whereas with a heavy throttle change, for example, if I spin up to speed step 50, it'll make the engine power up more quickly. Function two is an active brake sound on the Class 37 sound profile from Acura Scale as well, which means it actually physically slows the locomotive down as well as playing a brake sound. So next now our loco is coupled up to the train, we can use the buffering and coupling sound, which on this locomotive is number 14. 
when you release function 14, it makes the sound of the coupling dropping onto the hook as well. Now, there's one final thing we need to do now, because we now need to turn our tail lights off on this locomotive. So I'm going to first I'm going to switch directions, so we're facing the correct direction for the direction of travel. Then using function 17, shift and 17, I've turned off the tail lights on the loco, making it ready to depart with the train on the back. So when a diesel locomotive is a working light engine, it would always have its tail lights on to mark the end of the train. When it's coupled up to a train, the tail lights are always switched off. Right, so our train's now ready to depart. I'm going to make one more select, so I'm going to select function 5 which sets it into heavy train mode. It means it's going to work much harder in terms of the engine sounds that come out of the locomotive and where we're ready to have a little blast of the horn and drive away with our ballast train. Making Tracks 3, Pete Waterman's greatest model railway yet. When Mike Wilde suggested to build a station, there was only one option in Pete's mind. Milton Keynes Central on the West Coast Main Line. When you say it out loud, it's verging on madness to construct a brand new model railway that will be 64 foot long, 12 foot wide, less than 10 months to build it, 
and have it run reliably every day for six days a week. In this brand new series, we visit Milton Keynes Central Station and take you behind the scenes into the workshop as the rail nuts achieve the seemingly impossible, all in time for the layout's public unveiling at Chester Cathedral. Then came the grand challenge, taking the layout to the great electric train show and into the history books of model railways, when it was joined with making tracks one and two, becoming the largest portable double low gauge layout in Britain. Join us as we take you behind the scenes to look at just how Pete Waterman and the Railnuts team created Making Tracks 3. Right, so we've moved on to a, a steam subject now. We've got a, a Backman A1 on the layout, which has got factory fitted sound in it. It's got a, a low number of functions, a slightly earlier sound fitted model, but still plenty of playability in this as well. So we can start by turning the main sounds on, which is uh, function number one, and that brings on the main boiler sounds and steam sounds. And then uh, being a steam locomotive, we can actually simulate coal shoveling as well using function five on this particular locomotive. So that turns a coal shoveling sound on. And on some of the most modern sound field locos, that opens up a a firebox glow at the same time so you get both the lighting effect and the sound effect coming on at the same time. And then if our uh, fireman's got a little bit over eager, he's put too much coal in, got the pressure up too much, we could also simulate the safety valves blowing as well with function 7 on this loco. Then if our train's ready to depart, this one's actually got a trio of different whistles on it on functions two, three, and four, which give different lengths and pitches of whistle. So we'll try a function two whistle first.
Well, I think you'll have to agree that sound really does, as I said before, really bring your model railway completely to life. It's that 4D immersive experience, isn't it? Oh, definitely, yeah. It's, it's one of those things, I'll, I'll go into my own workshop and I'll, I'll turn one sound logo on and all of a sudden half an hour's gone because I've just been playing with it and just enjoying the sounds up and down the power and all the rest of it. It's fantastic. It is. Like, basically, once you pop, you can't stop. But look, we hope that you have enjoyed this first introduction um, to DCC sound. As complicated as you think it may be, it actually does become a lot more easier as you go along. Yeah, like anything, once you've actually started and got your hands into doing digital sound, all the things we've talked about will start to make sense. Uh, but I think when, when you first hear about it, it's like these are so many things to take in. Uh, but we have got lots of guides online as well. So if you go to keymodelworld.com forward slash digital dash sound, uh, you'll be able to find our full range of digital sound features there, including lots of beginners guides as well. That's it. Um, lots, lots of features to get into. You can see how we've done lots of installations step by step, showing mm. you all the photographs all the way through the process uh, and much more besides. Yeah, absolutely. Now, of course, make sure that you join us in part two of this series where we're going to start by looking at the Hornby triplex sound or TXS system as it's known as we're going to fit one of those to our locomotives and show you just how easy it is to install plug and play with that system. That's right and, and that's the point of the next part is it's all about plug and play and then in the further parts we've got for this series we're going to move on to do the same with ESU decoders and with Zimmer chips as well so you'll show you the full spectrum of digital sound. So of course by the end of episode number four you will know just as much as Mike. <laughs> Not a lot really. Anyway <laughs> it's a <laughs> Other important things to tell you, we have got the Hornby XXX sound decoders in stock on the Key Model World shop. So if you want to start shopping now to get your XXX sound chips ready to install in your locos, they're available right now from our shop.